Good morning, everyone. God be with you. See if I can get my own husband to sit down. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all here to Brunswick First United Methodist Church, and it's so good to see you all here this morning. We have an exciting day planned here at the church. Um, we are celebrating the grand opening of our children's wing upstairs. I don't know if you guys have been up there to see it yet, but it looks really good. We're calling it Splash Island. And please go up there and look. It, um, the halls are decorated. It's kind of the theme up there. And um, a lot of people have put in a lot of time to get it decorated up there. And I know our children will, will love the new feel and the excitement that we have going on up there. And to celebrate the grand opening, we're having a luau here at the church tonight. And what better way to celebrate than a covered dish dinner at the church in summertime? We have fruits and vegetables. Y'all bring whatever side dish you want. I love them all. And um, it'll be tonight at 5.30. We're providing the meat. You can probably smell it cooking down in the kitchen. It smells wonderful downstairs. So y'all plan to come tonight at 5.30. We have got another secret room that we're going to unveil upstairs that nobody has seen yet except a few select of us, and it looks wonderful. So we should be very thankful and proud of our church and excited that we have things going for the children in our church. So please, y'all come tonight at 5.30. It's a chance to pull out those crazy Hawaiian shirts you have. I know Scott bought a crazy one in Hawaii, and it is obnoxious. So he can pull it out, and nobody can laugh at him tonight. And I will even encourage him to wear it. So y'all, grass skirts, whatever you have, just dress and theme. And please come. It's an exciting time, and we all want to be here to celebrate for our kids. Um, the youth tonight will be leaving at 7 o'clock. Uh, you know, we're hoping that they'll come and eat dinner with us and everything and celebrate. They'll be leaving at 7 o'clock to go to the main event. And every week, the speakers are very good at the main event. Even if you don't have children, you may want to go hear the speaker. But the speaker this week um, is in a um, rock-based Christian band. And he should have a very interesting testimony to tell the stories that he's been through and um, the lives that he changes through his Christian worship music. And I know we have a lot of budding um, music enthusiasts in our church. So if you would like to hear him, please head over to the gathering place tonight. It should be wonderful. Um, we have a terrific Tuesday this week for our kids. Obviously, on Tuesday, they will be heading to Summer Waves. So kids, y'all please come on down at 10 o'clock. We'll try to have you back by 2. But um, bring your towel, wear your swimsuit, bring $20, and your lunch would be wonderful. So that's Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And the youth are having um, summer slam studies every Wednesday in Shannon's office from 3.30 to 5. And if y'all don't know, Shannon's office is upstairs. So y'all find Shannon. He can help direct you to it. But that's a wonderful um, activity every week for the youth. And our church council is meeting this Thursday at 6.30 in the fellowship hall. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship.
for the hymn of adoration which is found on your insert. It's a majesty medley. unite our hearts together in this historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. It's found at page 881 in the back of the hymnal if you're visiting with us today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
you please be seated if you will for just a moment it's good to see all of you here today uh, this is the middle of the summer and you're here in church on Sunday morning I'm so impressed I'm glad that you're here uh, a lot of things going on tonight is the luau and I hope that you will plan to be here in the life of our church we've got a new member joining this morning and also uh, we're going to anoint and pray for Eddie Ratcliffe at the close of the service Eddie's found some difficult news and going to Emory tomorrow so we're going to anoint and pray for him at the at the close of the service after we take Mitty Smith in as our newest member so uh, we're glad that you're here now if you're here as a first-time visitor this is your first time for coming to this church and you have looked at the preacher and said what kind of clothes is this preacher wearing in the pulpit if you're here for the very first time would you lift your hand we have a gift bag for visitors anybody who's a very first time visitor okay uh, yeah we've got okay very good now, if we have a Sunday where we don't have anybody lift their hand, who's not doing their job? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, it's up to you to invite folks to church, okay? I do it every day, and uh, so you help me in it. Stand and greet someone and turn and tell them what kind of a salad you're bringing to the luau tonight. And now if you could all register your attendance on the pad on the end of your pew. And as I say every week, please glance it over and make sure you know the name of the neighbor sitting by you in the pew. And check out the, the pad when you leave church. If there's somebody back there that you don't quite remember their name, just glance at the pad and then you can commit it to memory. The altar flowers today are given in the glory and honor of God. And aren't they beautiful today? And um, on our prayer list, we want to add Elaine Sly. She um, was diagnosed with MS, and she's a former member of our church, and they moved to Tennessee a couple of years ago. So please play for Elaine's family. Um, in the hospital this week, we have Ed Blanton. He's in room 2567. And at Marsh's Edge, we have Wayne and Tommy Wilson. And at Scottish Rite Children's Hospital is Victoria Elizabeth Hughes. And as always, please pray for our service personnel, Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Brian Hayes, Eric Friedrich, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, and Lauren Maynard, and our missionaries in the field, the Lovelace, Great House, Shiraz, and Trousdale families. Do we have other prayer concerns? The who? The Asbell family? L. Hicks? Gail Hicks. Okay, thank you, George. That is tragic. Um, so service personnel that are still overseas, we, we don't need to take them for granted that, that they're over there protecting us and protecting the world. So thank you, George. Mike Cannon. Allison Drew. I got them. And Eric Sly. 
Okay, Melissa McDonald's dad. The Ebony family. Ammon family. Kathy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, we will pray for him. As, as we go to prayer, I've, I've asked Eddie if he would come up during the prayer time. This is as good a time as any to pray for, to pray for Eddie, and i um, going to ask him to come and kneel. And we're, we're going to pray as we normally do, silently. You have a moment to lift up your own request before the throne of heaven, and then we'll uh, uh, pray and lift up these requests that you have lifted up, and particularly remembering our service personnel, and then... Uh, will uh, anoint Eddie and I, I want to just share with you I, I inherited this from my uncle um, this is a little bottle of anointing oil that was made from uh, olives from the Mount of Olives in in Jerusalem my uncle Dr. Bill Ford served 42 years in this annual conference and uh, there, there's nothing special in in the oil it's uh, it's what it stands for it stands for God's healing power and uh, and really in the Old Testament the oil Literally, when a person was anointed, it was poured on the head and it flowed down through the beard. Now, that doesn't sound very uh, like something you'd really like to get into, but oh my, what a tremendous significance it was to the people who saw folks when they were anointed by a prophet of God. They believed that God could work, and I hope that you will pray believing that God can work, and we're going to anoint Eddie and pray for him. So let's pray for a few moments silently and lift up your own requests before the throne of heaven, and then we'll join our hearts together in prayer. Father God, as we come into your presence today, we thank you that we have this place and that we're able to come together this time as a church to worship and to fellowship and to be in the presence of other, of other Christians. Lord, we're reminded that when David was fleeing through the wilderness from his son Absalom, as he hid in the cave, he prayed and he said, Lord, my desire is to be in the sanctuary with your congregation. And Lord, we, we thank you for what it means to us to draw together as a community of faith, believing that you're here to move and work and to hear our prayers and to answer our prayers. And Lord, we lift up those special requests. Each name that was called out this morning, there are those that have physical needs and spiritual needs. There are those who are going through their own personal storms. And Lord, we know that you are the God who hears and answers our prayers. And so we pray that you would be with each person that was lifted up. And our service personnel has been called to our attention this morning. Father, we're so grateful. We are so grateful. Give us grateful hearts. For those who are willing to answer the call to serve their country and for those who give their lives in the line of duty. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless their families, those who have experienced this loss. Lord, be to them what none of us can be. Be to them what nobody can be. Father, walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death, we pray. And Lord, we give you thanks for those who, have, uh, for those who serve. And even now, Lord, we, we remember that there are those uh, men and women who are on patrol. There are those who are serving in various stations around the world. And, Lord, we, we hear sometimes politicians say that, uh, that, that we need to end conflict. And, indeed, Lord, we want peace. We want peace more than anything else. But, Lord, we, we thank you for those who defend our freedoms. And, Lord, we know that there are those who would destroy this nation if they could. And so, Father, we pray that you would give our leaders wisdom. And we pray for strength for those who serve on the front lines. Now, Father, bless us this morning. And as Eddie kneels before us, we know that he's received this news from his doctor. And we anoint him with oil as the command in James tells us, Lord, that we're, when any's sick, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil 
And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And Lord, we just pray that you'll touch his body as he goes to Emory tomorrow. We're going to pray for a good report. We don't even know the extent of what the possibilities are. But Lord, we know what the possibilities are with you. And we just pray that you will touch him, that you'll strengthen him. He's yours. You called him into the ministry, Lord, and you saved him to preach the gospel. And Father, we thank you for the invitations to the kingdom that have been given through this man and this life. We just pray that you'll bless him, Lord, and heal his body, we pray. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us, Lord, that we need to come together to lift up our sick and to pray for healing. By his stripes, the prophet said, we could be healed. And so, Lord, we just pray for your touch in this body. And, Lord, we pray this prayer and all those that have been lifted up in the name of our Father and in the name of Jesus who taught us prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now we'll ask all of the children that are present to come and join us at the front. We've got children in our service today and we've got a special emphasis on children tonight. So come and join me down front here for a moment. Um, Miss Claudia is taking a, a couple of Sundays off, but you know what? Even though she took some Sundays off, she came to church this morning. She was at nine o'clock church. So, all right, y'all come on down here and sit on the steps and face me if you would. Okay, what do I have around my neck here? A lay, that's exactly right, it's a lay. Now, um, and a lay is what? Of course, it, it, originally it was made as a, as a wreath of flowers and so on to be a sign of what? Anybody know? What's, what's the sign of? Has anybody ever flown into Hawaii, into the airport? Have you been to Hawaii? And what happens when you get off the airplane? You walk off the airplane and what happens? There's somebody there to go. They put a lay on you. That's exactly right. They lay a, a lay on you. It's a sign of friendship, okay? It's a symbol of friendship, of a wreath made with flowers. Of course, we've made them out of fake flowers and stuff. But anyway, it is made as a symbol of friendship. Now, what is the plural? You know, the singular means one. Plural means many. What is the plural of lay? Anybody want to take a guess? Lays? Yeah, no. That it sounds like it should be, doesn't it? It just sounds like you ought to add an S to it, and it would be lays. But you know what the plural of lay is? Nay lay. That's what it means, nay lay. Now, nay lay also, in other words, all of these together, this is a lay. This is nay lay. It's a bunch of lays, okay? Now, and I'm, you, everybody's going to get one tonight, right? Miss Mack, is that right? And Nancy, they're, they're going to get one tonight when you come to the luau. Now, the luau starts at what time? Uh, what time does it start tonight? 5.30, good, okay. I'm expecting everybody here at 5.30. Now, there is a special surprise that's going to be unveiled tonight. You didn't see it this morning, even if you were on the children's wing, and I'm real excited about it because you know what? I got a sneak peek last night, late last night. So I'm real excited about it, so you come tonight and see what the surprise is. But you know what, it, what else NALE stands for? It stands for sweetheart or... Um, children. So you are Nele and the young lady sitting up there with the flowered print on and the lay in the choir. She's my Nele. That's right. She's my sweetheart. Okay. So now for Christians, what's the ultimate symbol of love? What is the ultimate symbol for Christians of love? When you see one, I hope that you'll think of 
love. Just like this, you see a lay and it stands for friendship, but what is the symbol for love for a Christian? Look right behind you, up behind the Bible. What is that? Cross. That's exactly right. The cross is the ultimate symbol of love. So let's pray and thank God for his love for us and thank him for the love that we can have for each other and love we're going to share tonight at the luau, okay? Lord, thank you for the fact that you love us, that you care for us and love us in ways that we don't really even understand, but we're grateful for it. So, Lord, help us. The Word of God says that we're to love each other like you loved us. So help us to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, see you tonight, 530. Now, if you can please stand for the hymn of preparation, which is found in our black hymnal, hymn number 2024, from the rising of the sun. and in this act of worship ask God to bless the work of our church Father we thank you that we can give we thank you that you have given to us so that we can give take these tithes and offerings and multiply them for the kingdom's sake in Jesus name Amen
God's word. This morning we're reading from Mark uh, chapter 4, 35 through 41. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. Thank you, choir, for something beautiful. That's a timeless classic in Christian music now. In 1969, Bill Gaither wrote Alleluia, one of the first great Christian musicals that really... Uh, opened up the Gaither world and Gaither music to the to the Christian world. Uh, it's good to see all of you here. Um, we had a wonderful, wonderful week this week with our granddaughters. You met Savannah and Abby last week in, in morning worship service. But uh, on Monday, my Megan flew in from Naples, Megan and Lexi. So I had three granddaughters and an unborn, as of yet, unborn grandson uh, who was here with Megan. And uh, looking forward to that later this fall. And then, uh, of course, my wife and I. Now, I had five little, uh, five ladies at the house this week. Next year, if we do this, I'm going to call Fort Stewart for a platoon for backup. Um, it uh, It was quite an experience. I took the girls home on Thursday. And Jimmy and I got to do some things together. It was very, very interesting. Y'all, Matt Hearn, who is our new church pastor in Macon, starting a new church, uh, gave to Jimmy, gave to the Ridge, their church, which is a new Methodist church in Macon, uh, had bought some equipment from a church that folded in Indianapolis. And uh, it was a new church plant that didn't fly. And uh, they found out about it online through some church internet stuff. And, uh, and then they were able to, Matt was able to send a truck up. They rented a truck and bought this, brought this big equipment down. Now, when they have moved now into a permanent facility, so he said, we're crossing, he told Jimmy, he said, we're crossing our Rubicon. And he said, we're, we're going into a permanent facility and we're going to give you all this equipment. Now, these boxes are these custom-made equipment boxes that are about six feet uh, wide and four and a half feet deep and about seven feet tall. 
and they gave five of them. I can't imagine what it costs to make these things, but uh, Jimmy is still a setup church, what they call a setup church for new church plants. They go into a, a theater, um, Carmike Cinemas in, uh, in Columbus every Sunday this morning. They had a big crew up there for their first service and then their second service. Then they'll take it all down at 1 o'clock and be in time, be out of there in time for the 3 o'clock matinee this afternoon. So they do that every week. I can't imagine how they do it, but they've got wonderful volunteers and they work hard. So uh, it's a neat, neat thing. But here's, here's what really struck me this week when, when I saw this. Matt said to Jimmy, Matt Hearn and, and my son Jimmy, he said, we're, we're going to give this to you since you're a new church plant. And I thought, how wonderful to see churches cooperating like that, especially new church starts and and uh, there's got to be a better way to work together that when we don't need something anymore, we can give it to somebody who does need it. And I thought it was just a neat, neat thing. Now, let me share this with you. I thought this was a humorous story, and, uh, and I liked it a lot. Um, and the, the title of this little story is, Assailant, Assailant Suffers Injuries from a Fall. It says, Tyrone Jackson, a store manager for Best Buy in Augusta, Georgia, told police he observed a male customer later identified as Orville Smith of Augusta on surveillance cameras putting a laptop computer under his jacket. When confronted, the man became irate, knocked down an employee, drew a knife, and ran for the door. Outside on the sidewalk were four U.S. Army Rangers collecting toys for the Toys for Tots program. Jackson said the Rangers stopped the man, but he stabbed one of the Rangers, Corporal Philip Dugan, in the back. The injury did not appear to be severe. After the police and an ambulance arrived at the scene, Corporal Dugan was transported for treatment. The perpetrator, Orville Smith, was also transported to the local, local hospital with two broken arms, a broken ankle, a broken leg, several missing teeth, multiple broken ribs, multiple contusions, assorted lacerations, a broken nose, and a broken jaw. <laughs> Injuries he sustained when he slipped and fell off the curb after stabbing the ranger, according to a police report. <laughs> so be fairly warned, if you visit Augusta, watch out for the sidewalks, okay? Just watch out for the curbs. <laughs> The heat's on. The heat is on. The perfect storm. We're advertising for tonight with the, with the Hawaiian shirt. And I hope that you're going to come. I hope that we're going to have a I know that we'll have a good time together. Plus, you'll be surprised at the upstairs, which brings up the fact that we need an elevator to the second floor. I don't know how we're going to do that, but we need that at some point in the future. We're also going to need some green space for a children's playground outside. Somehow, somewhere, we've got to get that. So things that we can work for in the future. Now, what if you knew ahead of time, every time the Lord had a lesson for you? What if you knew beforehand, the, and God said to you, I, I've got something I want you to learn. Get ready. I'm glad he doesn't do that. I don't think I'd be up for it all the time. And this is one of those situations when we talk about the perfect storm. The reason that I want to call this the perfect storm is because a lot of things come together in this moment of time for the disciples to begin to learn some things that they need to learn. There's a lesson for them. They needed to learn some things in order for them to be effective. Now, these are the men to whom Jesus is entrusting the kingdom of God. These are the ones to whom he is entrusting the truth that will become the church that causes you and I to gather as the Brunswick First United Methodist Church. These are the men that he's giving this to, that he's giving this trust to. And there are some things that they have to learn. Now, aren't these men, though, filled with fear? Oh, my. They are so filled with fear and they have to overcome those fears if they're going to become apostles the movement from being a learner to one who is sent to teach and there's some important things that they need to learn there are some important things that God has for you in the Christian life and it may be found in the middle of the storm now stick with me on this. Now, there are good fears and there are bad fears. Good fears and bad fears. Good fears 
give us precautions in life. I'll, I'll never forget when Jimmy, and I thought about this this past week as we were working together in Columbus, and I remember the time that he was about three and a half, almost four years old. We lived on 41 North. We had a house on 41 North going out of Perry, Georgia, between Perry and Macon. I was the youth director at Perry Methodist Church. And by the way, I want to say uh, Shannon had a great uh, time yesterday with our youth. They went skiing and had a great, great time, and I heard about it, and I know that we're looking forward to more of those kinds of events with our young people. But being the youth director of that church, living on 41, I had a yard that went straight down about, about as deep as, as maybe just a little bit shorter than from here to the back doors of the sanctuary. And I made a rule. You know, there's some things about fear that I think we're missing today. Now, we're a society riddled with fear. We're, we're, pe we're people that are riddled with fear. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily good, but I think that we're missing a fear that's a healthy fear in society. We're missing a, a healthy fear of punishment. We're missing a healthy fear of the, what happens if we fail or disobey. We're missing some healthy fear in our society. Now, I remember telling Jimmy, and went out in the front yard, it, it worried us living on, living on 41 North, the traffic just flying up and down that, that road. No, nobody paid attention to the, to the speed limit signs, like you and me. And, uh, and I, had a lot, I had a rule for Jimmy. And I said that the front yard went out to a ditch that went down. At the top of the ditch, there was an imaginary line. Like I said, if, they, if I'd have known there were such things as dog collars and things to put, I might have put one on him to make sure that he didn't get out in the, in the highway. But they didn't have those things back then. This was 35 years ago, 34 years ago. And I told him, I said, now, Jimmy, if you cross this line, if you cross this line, I'm going to spank you. Now, you, we all have our different, differing opinions as to how we raise children, okay? And you might want to know mine. You might not want to know mine. And I really don't care. But I can tell you this, that I, I agree with Dobson. I like what Dr. Dobson's advice is to, children, to parents with children. And pretty much observed that most of my life with my children. And I told Jimmy, I said, make no mistake about it. If you cross this line, I'm going to paddle your little behind. I'm a firm believer in applying the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge when necessary. I was working in the front yard. You know how kids are? I turned my back just for a second. And I thought we had this understanding. And I turned around, and Jimmy was down in that ditch. And I said, oh, my heart just stopped. I said, Lord, just uh, uh, slay him in the spirit. Make him fall down in that ditch so that he doesn't get up and go on that ride. I raced out there, and I tackled him in the ditch. And I got him back up to the house. And after a long discussion about why what was going to happen was going to happen, it happened. And I paddled his little behind. And you know what? There was a healthy fear that was produced in his life that became a precaution. And there is such a thing as healthy fear. However, there's such a thing as bad fears. There's such a thing as bad fears that happens in our lives, and we can be ruled by our bad fears. And you know what? Our bad fears can lead us to some aberrant behavior. Just two of what I want to lift up. Bad fear can paralyze us. The wrong type of fear can cause us to be paralyzed in our lives. I'll tell you what else happens to bad fear, and, and I'm talking from a graduate course and several graduate courses in psychology that I had toward my doctorate. We can repress our fears. And, and I like, I think it was Jung who, who had this illustration of you take a, a ball, a plastic ball, and you put it underwater in the pool, and the farther you push it down, the higher it pops up the more you push it down. You, you try to hold it down, and, and when you let it go, it, poof, it comes to the surface. Or if you try to hold it in this way, it's going to roll out, and it'll come up over here, and it'll pop up to the surface. And the deeper you go, the more you push it down, the higher it's going to bounce out of the water. And what happens with bad fears so often is that we try to push them down, and you know what? They surface in other places in our lives and produce some terrifying results sometimes. Now, the disciples are feared with, filled with bad fear. Not only were they afraid of the wind and storm, nothing wrong with that particularly. We'll look at that in just a minute. But the word says, after Jesus calmed the sea. Did you see that on the screen? They were exceedingly filled with fear. Who is this? You see, the storm's gone, but now they're afraid of Jesus. 
Do you see why this lesson is going to be so important for these men? They're going to have to go into the world and proclaim this truth of who this is. What are they going to do? Give a message of fear? Now, this is the first of four boat crossings. Isn't it amazing? We live here on the coastline. I love living on the coast. Isn't it amazing how many times Jesus used the coast, used the water, used boats to help the disciples learn things? I mean, they're out another time, and a storm happens. Jesus isn't with them, and he comes walking across the water. And a post-resurrection appearance. They're fishing all night, don't catch anything, and then they, their nets are filled. And he says, come here. I don't want you to be fishermen. I want you to be fishers of men. There's so many lessons that he has for them. Now, the thing is that these are men who are riddled by fear. You can see fear, can't you? You can see fear. I know I shared with you the illustration of being on a canoe on the boundary waters in Canada. And, and a wind, just as it says here, the storm wasn't in the sea. The, sin was, the, the storm was a windstorm that came up. And a young man and I, Rob Tuggle, was in the front of the canoe, and I was in the back. I was taking his daddy's place, actually, because his daddy got sick, and, and there were four of us on the boundary waters in a 16-foot ca uh, canoe, and a windstorm came up, and the waves that were white caps about two to three feet off, and that doesn't look like much to those of you who have been out here when the waves have been four and five feet and six feet maybe, but when you're in a little canoe where the gunnel's only six inches out of the water, that's a terrific storm. And the shore was about half a mile that way, a mile that way, two miles back there, and four miles ahead. And we're out in the middle of the lake. And I'll never forget, Rob, a 16-year-old young man, turned around and looked at me, and there was sheer terror on his face. You could see the fear. It was palpable. And I said, Lord, help us. And he did. They say that animals can smell fear. It's the reason you need to stand down a barking dog because animals can smell fear. Well, here's my first point this morning. You see, the need was to bring these fears. The disciples' need may well be your need this morning. What was their need? Their need was to bring their fears under God's control. The first point is this. Wind and waves produce storms. Have you been in this boat? Have you ever been in this boat that the disciples are in? You see, wind and waves by themselves are not necessarily bad. Oh, we can look at a 30-foot wave off the coast of Hawaii and see pipeline and see surfers and see competition and World Cup competition. But oh, you see, you can look at a 30-foot 30 30 wave that there's no end from horizon to horizon, a tsunami. And it's sheer devastation. I've got a picture sometime that I'll show you in a sermon that I do, but it shows uh, the tsunami, the Sumatran tsunami that came in. And these people are standing on the beach watching it. And I'm thinking, what are they looking at? What are they, what are they thinking? They're about to die. Well, we're fascinated with storms. And the word says there arose a great storm of wind. Now, let me tell you, there are two kinds of storms. When wind and waves get together, there's going to be a storm. There are two kinds of storms in your life. The first kind of a storm is the storm that we might create ourselves. You say, Jim, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I want to take you, this is kind of a little sidetrack just a second, but do you know on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit's moving was signified by tongues of fire? Do you know that in the book of James, go over quite a few books in the book of James, and we read that there's a world of fire that started by this little flapper between our gums. And I want to say to you this morning that if, you, if you're in the middle of a storm that you created, you're on your own. And the best lesson for us as Christians is not to start those kind of storms. And that's perhaps not most of us this morning. 
But some of us are sitting in this boat that the disciples are in. These circumstances are beyond our control. We've heard things that we didn't want to hear. Things have happened over which we had absolutely no control. We sense that the waves are coming into the boat and we're saying, Lord, help us. Help us now. Wind and wave produce storm. Everybody is going to experience a storm. At some time. I try to tell that to young married couples, young people who are getting married, I'm sorry, in premarital counseling. You're going to go through a storm, and they look at me like, not us, we're in love. <laughs> and I want to tell them, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Everybody goes through storms. Everybody goes through times when it feels like the boat's sinking. The second thing that I want you to see this morning is that fear and faith can't ride in the same boat. You say, what do you mean fear and faith can't ride in the same boat? Well, I want you to see this picture. Get this vignette. Here's Jesus. There are two things about Jesus sleeping in the boat in the middle of the storm that, 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 that are very appealing pictures to me. One is that the human side of him is exhausted. He's exhausted. If, the reason he's exhausted is if you look at Mark 3... You see all these parables. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching, and he's teaching, and he's teaching, and all these parables are coming out, and people are listening, and they're hearing, and they're pulling from him. And those of you who have ever taught, you know what it's like to have students, and your students just suck it out of you. They pull it out of you, and it can be exhausting. And Jesus was exhausted after a long, hard time day of work and it doesn't matter whether you're in music ministry when you're in ministry it can be exhausting the God side of him had made it all <laughs> that's what's so wonderful to me he could sleep on a pillow he made it he created it he was the logos in the book of John now I want to say to you this morning fear is a feeling faith is a response Fear is a feeling. Faith is a spiritual response. I, I want you to hear this. this. This is from Wesley's journey. You've heard this illustration. I've used it a little. But I want you to hear it from Wesley's mouth. January 25th, 1736, in his journal. At 7, I went to the Germans. Now, he called the Moravians the Germans. It's kind of interesting. But at times, he called them the Moravians. And at other times, he called them the Germans. He said, I had long before observed the great seriousness of their behavior. Of their humility, they had given a continual proof by performing those servile offices for the other passengers, which none of the English would undertake, for which they, uh, for which they desired and received no pay, saying it was good for their proud hearts. Listen, when was the last time that you did something demeaning and said, it's good for my proud heart? Have you ever? I think I can count on one hand the times that I have. Or also saying their, long, uh, their loving Savior had done more for them. And every day given them occasion of showing a meekness which no injury could move. If they were pushed, struck, or thrown down, they rose again and went away. But no complaint was found in their mouth. There was now an opportunity of seeing whether they were delivered from the spirit of fear as well as that of pride, anger, and revenge. Listen, how wonderful to be able to look at somebody else and say, That person has been delivered of the spirit of pride, anger, and revenge. <laughs> what a testimony. In the midst of the psalm wherewith their service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sang on. I asked one of them afterwards, were you not afraid? And he answered, I thank God, no. And I asked, but were not your women and children afraid? He replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. From them I went to their crying, trembling neighbors and pointed out to them the difference in the hour of trial between him that fears God and him that fears him not. At 12 the wind fell. Now listen to what he says. <laughs> this is wonderful. This was the most glorious day I have hitherto seen. What an incredible testimony. Listen, fear's response. Fear's response is avoidance, fight. Try to control it, those three things. But here's faith responses, and I lift them up to you, therefore. Number one, faith response is 
Always remember who's in control. Always remember when you're in the boat, when the waves are coming over the edge and you feel like you're sinking. Always remember who's in control. Secondly, pray. Pray. Listen, that's what the disciples did when they went to the Lord and they grabbed him. They said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish. We're going to sing those words in a minute in the closing song. Carest thou not that we perish. They were praying. Listen, when you learn to get a hold of God like the disciples got a hold of him, even though he's not physically present, you'll see God move and work. Thirdly, bail the boat. Don't quit doing the good things. Don't quit doing the right things. You see, remember who's in control. Pray. Bail the boat. Oh, I've seen people get in the midst of problems, difficulties, that they just feel like they're going to have to give up on life, and they turn around to do bad things, the wrong things. I think, hey, do that. Don't give up. Don't give up. And always remember, number four, that getting to the other side is the goal. Getting to the other side of the lake is the goal. The last thing that I want you to see, the third point. You're going to make it. Trusting Jesus will give you smooth sailing. Trusting Jesus will give you smooth sailing. Your house can stand in the storm. Your boat can make the trip. And you know what? It may be that only in the storm we can know who Jesus is. That's tough to say, but I believe it. It may be that only in the storm that we could find out who Jesus is. I'll never forget talking about identity in a storm. I saw this in, a, in some material that was printed out, and a man just printed it off like it was an illustration of something. He said a, a man was standing by his house in, in uh, Miami when, when Hurricane Andrew went through. Listen, I have this on video. I mean, this is true. I was the president of the home affiliate for Habitat for Humanity. There were five houses in a particular place beneath Black Point where Hurricane Andrew came ashore that if you got up in any one of those five houses that were standing and looked in any direction as far as you could see, you couldn't see the end of the devastation. I have never, ever, I went to Hugo, I went to some of the smaller ones, Charlie and Opal, and, and now Katrina was a different thing because it had that flood in New Orleans. But as far as the width of the devastation, I have never, ever seen anything like Hurricane Andrew. You could stand on the top of those houses and look as far as the eye can see, and remember that you can see 15 miles to the horizon. And you couldn't see the end of the devastation. And there were five houses standing in a row. And you know what? They were habitat houses. They were built to code. They were built correctly. Each nail was pounded in by hand. And those houses withstood. And habitat had a good identity because of that. Listen. If God took you out in the boat, he's going to bring you back. If God took you out in the boat, he's going to bring you back. There's some fallout to this that I want you to see. Because so often, so often when we go through things, there's some fallout that God wants us to share with others. I don't know if you, if you saw it when Monica was reading the text, but it said other little boats followed him. Jesus got into one with the disciples. Pretty good size, must have been a pretty good sized fishing vessel. Other little boats followed them. The wind and the waves beat on those boats too. And you know what? When Jesus stood up and he said, in the Greek it's translated, be silent, be muzzled. That's the, that's the correct translation of the word. Be muzzled. And there was peace and calmness. Now you know what? The fallout is all those other little boats experience the peace and calmness. God doesn't just bless you for your sake. Carry that with you. God does not just do something for you for your sake. Or for your boat's sake. But for the sake of others who need to know that they're not going to sink either. Two questions. The disciples said, do you not care? And Jesus said, do you not have faith yet? When you are tempted to look into the face of God and say, God, don't you care what I'm going through? I want you to hear Jesus responding and saying to you, 
Do you not have faith yet? Do you not have faith yet? Oh, listen, they didn't get it at this point, but they're learning. <laughs> they're learning. And they're going to get it. And you know why I know they got it? Because they died for it. Each one of them. They died for it. I want us to sing this song. I haven't sung this song in a long, long time. And Donna found this. She said, do you know Peace Be Still? I said, oh, my, I used to sing that as a child in our, in our church. And I want us to sing this in, uh, in closing. And then at the end of that, I'm going to ask Mitty to come forward. And listen, there may be somebody else here this morning who knows that it's, it's, it's time. It's time for you to join this church. We've, we've got folks that have been visiting regularly. And if this is your day uh, to come and be a part of this fellowship, um, I'd like for you to come and stand with Mitty. And we'll receive you into the fellowship of this church. So let's stand to sing our closing hymn together. Peace be still. song to close our service and um, you all remember that a couple of weeks ago Sandy uh, joined our church and this is her sister Mitty kind of reminds you of Andrew going and getting his brother doesn't it uh, we're glad to have Mitty I'll ask you the question that we ask of all of those uniting with the fellowship of our church and that is will you be loyal to this church and uphold it by your prayers presence gifts service and your witness Good. And let me be the first as the senior pastor of this church to welcome you into the fellowship of this church and say it's 
just a joy to have you. You've been attending for quite a while. It's a joy to have you as a part of this church. So uh, I'm going to take her back to the narthex so that you can join her. So receive this benediction, if you will. Lord, as we go from this place, we pray that you would calm the storm. Some of us are going through some very difficult times right now. And we just pray that you would calm the wind and the waves and help us to learn where to put our trust. We pray this in Jesus' name.